chapter 8 and Luke 7. Matthew 8 and then Luke 7. What do you want Jesus to find in you? What is it that he has found in you? I'm going to read both of these stories. They're both of the same event. Some of you, when I read it, is you're just going to go right on and you're not going to hear it. Others of you, I need to give a, just a, a lesson. Let, let me ask you this first. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 26, you don't have to turn there. You can just trust me on that one, I hope. Matthew 25, verse 26. It's, it's, it's just kind of a summary sentence. And there it says, in that, in that verse, it makes this statement, Pilate scourged Jesus. Now, for those of you that may not know what the word scourge means, it means that Pilate gave Jesus the lashing, the whipping, the beating, the, the scars that were on his back. It says, Pilate scourge Jesus. When you read that, do you see Pilate with the whip in his hand? But it sounds like it, doesn't it? It sounds like Pilate has the whip in his hand. But the other gospels break it down and let us know that, that Pilate authorized the scourging of Pilate, I mean of Jesus. He didn't, he didn't actually do the scourging, but the scripture says Pilate scourged Jesus. The soldiers are the one that used the whip and scourged Jesus. So when you read that, you don't think there's any kind of problem or, or that it's a lie or a contradiction, do you? No. The same thing would be if you made the statement today that Hitler slaughtered the Jews. The truth is, we don't know of historically whether Hitler actually ever pulled a trigger or actually hit a button or whether he pulled a lever. We don't know that Hitler actually ever personally killed a Jew. But his authority granted it to be done. Would you agree in that? So there are some things that come from a position of authority, all right? So let me read the scripture, and then I'll tell you why I felt like I needed to do that. And, um, and then we're going to go, because that's not the sermon, all right? But I do know that I know enough about some of you. You're extremely focused on details and extremely OCD like me. And when I read these two scriptures, Two, the same event in two scriptures, some of you are going to go, oh, wait a second, which is it? So, and there's a reason why I'm reading both, because I want to, you know, I struggle. I thought, well, I'll just pick one of them, and I won't have to deal with this, all right? But there are some, inf there's some information that is found when you only put the two together, all right? So Matthew chapter 8, verse 5 through verses 13. Now, when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion, that is a Roman soldier, came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled, or he was amazed, he was astonished, and said to those who followed, uh, surely I say to you, and here's where the title of the passage comes, where the sermon comes, what do you want Jesus to find in you? Jesus says, I'm telling you, I solemnly declare, I assuredly tell you the truth. I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not in Israel, not in all of Israel. I haven't found this kind of faith. And I say to you, 
This section is not found in Luke, okay? And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. The imagery there is of a great feast that is taking place in heaven with God's people. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. Luke chapter 7. Verse 1 through 10. Well, now, when Jesus concluded all his sayings, he has just finished the Sermon on the Mount in Luke's version. In the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum, and a, a certain centurion's servant who was dear or greatly loved by him, that's the centurion, was sick and ready to die. So when he, that is the centurion, heard about Jesus, now we'll find out how well you were listening. He sent elders of the Jews to him, pleasing with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, that is, those that were sent by the centurion soldier, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving or worthy of Jesus to do this act of healing. And the reason he was deserving or worthy is because he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, other people besides the elders, to him saying to him Lord do not trouble yourself for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof there and I've corrected that's a Yankee roof everybody time I use say roof people say in the south say, it's not roof that's what dogs do it's roof roof well let me tell you up north it's roof is what a dog does okay I am not, he, you should enter, that you should enter under my, you tell me whether it's roof or roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. For I am also, I also, and here, here's the thing, I also am a man placed under authority. This is almost the same as in Matthew having soldiers under me I say to one go and he goes and to another come and he comes and to my servant do this and he will do it when Jesus heard these things he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you I have not found such great faith not even in Israel and those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well who had been sick First thing, do not confuse this story, this miracle, with the first miracle that I started out with, the miracle of the healing of the Noah man's son. Because that's found, as we read, that was in John chapter 4, verse 46 and 54. Many things are different about that. This event is in Capernaum. The noble man's son healing was a son. This is a slave. The other one was a nobleman, was a Jewish man. This is a centurion, a Gentile. The other one was in Cana, and this one is in Capernaum. This one talks about faith, and the other one talks about signs where you need signs for faith. They're not the same story. But this is the same story recorded in Luke 7 and Matthew 8. So a couple things before I can get to the sermon. Let's get this out of the way. Well, first of all, Matthew's purpose and Luke's purpose in being inspired by the Holy Spirit to write are very, very different. Luke writes Luke and Acts, and he writes it to go as a letter that was to go before Paul because Paul is a prisoner about to lose his life. And it's all about who, and Paul's about to lose his life because of what he has said about Jesus. And so Luke is 
is basically given the job to write an explanation from the beginning up to the point where Paul is in jail about why and all about Jesus and why Paul does this. And so when you read Luke, you, you got to keep on reading into Acts because they're really just, they're not two letters, they're one, one letter. And so Luke's job is to present facts to an emperor who doesn't have a clue about it. And so Luke even tells us in Acts and Luke that he is writing in an orderly manner. Details are important to Luke. Matthew, though, is different. Matthew is writing to the Jews, and he's constantly giving you and I summaries. There's a whole, you can, if you've got to go to Luke or Mark or John to find the details. Matthew's just making the summary statements. The other thing is, because if you read them, you think, well, which is it? Well, there's not a contradiction. Just like Pilate may have never carried the whip, it's okay to say because of his authority that he scourged Jesus, right? This whole message is about authority. This is a centurion soldier. He even says, if I tell someone to go, they go. But come, they come. He's over 100 soldiers. And so when he goes, it's the same thing as being done in his name. We do that with Jesus, by the way. I hope you do. I know Dr. Barnes, if he was here, would hope you would do. That you never give glory to a medicine or to a doctor. You give all glory and healing to who? Jesus. The means really aren't important, are they? Not in relationship to giving him praise or glory because you recognize that God, Jesus, is over all and he has all authority and so we give him praise. We don't give the medicine we're on or the chemo treatment we had or the radiation or the doctors we had. Regardless of how good and how um, kind and gentle they were, the praise doesn't lie with them. That would be what? For a Christian to do that, that would be what? That would be idolatry. It's called sin. That's exactly right. You don't give the glory that belongs to God to any man, and you don't share his glory with any man or anything or any structure. We know that, right? You know that. So when I declare that God did a work in my life, the means and the methods may change, but none of them get the glory. This centurion soldier, by the way, is a Gentile. He's a Roman. And this word servant literally means slave. I, if you do some work... It talks about him building a synagogue. Let me give a denarii. A denarii was what one day's wage was. I don't know what your one day's wage is, but in the biblical term, it would be a denarii. Now, I guarantee it that a day's wage for each of us in here is different. But whatever your day's wage is, that's, that would be a denarii biblically. And you think, well, well, hey, well, his is $50. The other one is 200 or whatever. It, it doesn't matter. In the biblical term, a denarii was the day's wage. Now, it was true. It was the average day's wage. But let me give you the comparison between the centurion and his soldier. The average soldier made 250 denarii a year. When you figure that out with what we know about how many days is in a year, they average more than two days a week off. Or they work 24-7 and we're only paid for five. But what about a centurion soldier? 
You have any idea what the 250 for, he's got 100 soldiers he's under, over. Each of them make 250 denarii uh, for the year. This centurion makes at the starting pay, when he is exalted to a centurion, he makes at his starting pay 5,000 denarii. I mean, when he goes from here to that, there is no comparison in pay. And it went all the way up to 7,000 denarii a year. This guy's pretty well. He, he, he doesn't have any worry. He's making at least 25 times more than the guy that's under him. 25 times more. He has authority. He has power. Literally, when he tells one of those guys to move, they move. But there's some amazing differences between this guy. This guy is, is a lot alike another centurion that Luke also writes about. Because you see, remember Luke also wrote Acts? In Acts chapter 10, he gives us the name of a centurion soldier. Now, he's not in, he's not living in Capernaum, he, he, and his name is Cornelius. And this guy is a God seeker too. And all the Jews like Cornelius too. He worships, he is seeking after God, but he's not, he's not a believer, he's not saved yet. And he has this vision about he needs to, an angel comes to him and says, you need to send for, for um, uh, Peter. And so he sends for Peter and Peter comes and his, he and his whole household are saved. This man also is recognized. At least three things, or four things, the scripture chooses to make sure we understand about this man besides the fact that he is in tons of authority and power. One, he owns slaves. Do you know, any of you, can you just think in your mind, all right, he owns slaves. This is a historical fact, by the way. You see, the Romans believed that it was, they were not, they were too worthy. Get this idea, the words. The Romans believed that they were too worthy to do any work. Any. They were called to be in power. From the simple Roman all the way up. So, if you're called that you're only called to give orders, then you create a nation of slaves, and every nation you conquered, you enslaved them. They were forced. How many slaves, historically, do you think the Roman Empire had at the time of Jesus? 60 million. They had a whole nation of slaves. And it went from their doctors, every position, every position from low high. Well, they weren't the only ones. The Babylonians did it the same thing, remember? They came in, and when they conquered Israel, they took the brightest and the smartest. That's how Daniel ends up in the Bible, and they enslaved them. So did the Assyrians, and so did every other nation. They didn't just look for labor force. Everybody was to be their slave. Everybody, no matter how smart or how powerful or how knowledgeable, they were all enslaved. Well, the thing that catches our attention in the Scripture is not that he has a slave. He's different. As Luke says, he loves his slave. The Greek word that is used in Luke for servant or slave is in the child form, meaning that this is not a grown adult. This is a boy, teenager maybe, the child it's a child slave. It's 
say, well, that didn't happen. Yeah, you know the story of Naaman in the Bible? Naaman gets leprosy. And if you remember, the only way that Naaman actually is healed is because Naaman has taken a young child, a young girl, from among Israel when he conquered him. He took her away from her parents and from her, from her land, took her all the way, and he gave her to his wife to be her slave. And this slave girl, when she hears about that her master Naaman has leprosy, she tells her master, Naaman's wife, there is a prophet in Israel that can heal my master. And because this child slave does that, Naaman is healed. This man loves a slave. In Roman life, a slave was a possession. When they outused them, you killed them or you just, you just got rid of them. They were of no value. They were a possession, just like a car that broke down or anything else. But this guy is different. He cares. It, this slave is dear to his heart. Second thing, he loves God's people. He loves God's people. Another thing that is different among the Romans, the Romans didn't like the Jews, and the Jews didn't like the Romans. But this guy loves God's people, and the leaders among God's people love him. The third thing, he built them their place of worship. Do you know that even today in archaeology, there is and only has been one synagogue in all of Capernaum. Almost all of Jesus' ministry is done in Capernaum. Almost all of his ministry is done around this synagogue. And this synagogue was built by a non-Jew. This guy's different. But the other thing is, his faith, his faith is different than, it's different than the Romans. And as Jesus says, I haven't found any of my people, I haven't found any of my people that have this kind of faith. This man's different so different that God singles him out and says you need to tell this story in Hebrews chapter 11 it says that faith pleases God this man has faith that pleases God far above and uh, beyond everybody else in Ephesians it tells us that this kind of faith is the only thing that can save us. This man has pleasing faith and saving faith, but he's not saved yet. We also find that this kind of faith is very rare. So much so that in this text, Jesus makes this declaration. There will be many that call themselves mine that will go to hell. And he doesn't lift up a Jew to show the difference. He lifts up a man that is probably richer than the rich young ruler. He picks out a man that has given more to Israel than Nicodemus. He picks out a man that has more faith than Peter does. Because remember when Jesus says, I have not found this kind of faith in all of Israel? You mean, you know what that means? That means none of his disciples have it either. 
No. This man's an exception. The man doesn't think he's an exception, which is always beautiful. The Romans were incredible people. They, they learned to speak, especially like the soldiers, centurions. They learned to speak just about every language that they conquered. It was, it was a must. They didn't have to. And by that time, the world was basically speaking Greek everywhere to get around. But the Romans, a good Roman, would, especially one with authority, would learn how to communicate in the other people's languages. And yet, the language for the Romans was not Greek. It was what we call today Latin. Do you know what the Latin word for humility is? H-U-M-U-S, humus which means dirt. I'm just dirt. This man makes a declaration. And it's this declaration that blows Jesus' mind about faith. And that declaration is, I'm dirt. There is, I'm not worthy for you to come into my home. I'm not deserving. Well, it's interesting though, right? Let, let me give you some of the contrasts in these two scriptures. The centurion pleads for a dying slave. The Jews plead for the centurion. The Jews declare that if there's a man in all of Capernaum that deserves you to heal or do a miracle, it's the centurion. But the centurion declares there is no way that anyone is worthy or deserving for you to even come into my home. Now, he doesn't talk about healing. I'm not worthy or deserving for you to even come in my home. I'm just human. I'm just dirt. And that is what causes Jesus to say, I haven't found like that kind of faith. And I'm telling you, it's very rare in churches because whenever you and I be ta start talking about the need for healing in somebody else's life, immediately our mind goes back to the place, well, they're young, they're vibrant, or they've served the Lord all their life. You owe me, God. You owe me. You know why you and I can do that in our mind, whether we ever say it in our mouth? The reason we do it in our mind, because we don't know anything about being dirt. We forget that this was made out of dirt. And we forget that this is going back to dirt. There is nothing in my life, anything in my life, that makes me deserving for what God has done. God didn't save J.J. or Lauren or Mary Jo or Don or any of you because you are worthy. And if you take every man that ever has lived and put them together, all of them together still don't make mankind worthy of that sacrifice. He did it for the same reason this centurion wants Jesus to do it. Because he loves his slave. He didn't build the synagogue so that he could be worthy. He doesn't tote around how much he's given to the church as a way to make himself worthy. Remember, that's all the people that go to church that are doing that. No. 
This man really knows who he is in comparison to Jesus. And he sees himself way, way down. You see, this man understands who Jesus is. And according to Luke, it doesn't look like they've ever seen each other face to face. In fact, it makes it clear he does what he does because he heard about Jesus. There's a beautiful scripture at the end of one of the Gospels where old Thomas had made the declaration because he wasn't there when Jesus showed up at the resurrection. He made the declaration, I will not believe till I stick my hand in and till I touch. Till I see, I won't believe. Jesus shows up, makes him eat those words. Jesus offers him. He's already seen. Now Jesus offers him the touch. By the way, there's no indication that he actually ever touched. It's almost like he falls down. But then Jesus declares these words. Blessed are those who have not seen or heard but who believe, who believe, I'm sorry, who have not seen, but who believe because they've heard. You see, that's us. It, it appears by what Jesus makes declaring about the East and West that this centurion is going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the very elders of the synagogue aren't. Let that sink in. Do not be caught up and distracted by the differences. Be overwhelmed by what Jesus finds in this one man. And ask yourself, What is he finding in you right now? What is distracting you and consuming all of your intention and all of your prayer right now? What are you afraid of? Is your fear greater than your faith right now? What is crippling you? I want to have another conversation with you. It may not be fear. And I've had this... I have, I've, I've skirted around it, but I ain't going to skirt around it this morning. All right? I'm sick and tired, and I'm not God. But I got a feeling God's sick and tired of hearing this too. About how much you used to be plugged in. About how much you used to do. How your zeal and your commitment and involvement for the kingdom of God was out the roof. Do you think God cares whether you, whether you were hurt or whatever? No, he's sitting there thinking. He says, what happened? Do you think you're so worthy that you can just take a decade or more a break from me? Do you think that's what it's supposed to be about? Some of you I know from other churches, and I know a day in those churches, strong, where you taught, where you gave everything. What's he finding in you right now? Are you just limping? Where is your zeal and commitment? He knows the days when you were involved in youth or children or whatever kind of life and ministry. He knows when you were in your word, in his word. He knows when you really used to pray and not just when bad things happen. He knows when worship took on a different meaning for you. Well, maybe fear, anxiety, just being stuck isn't your problem.
maybe you feel like you just lost your way. I said, don't you know the way? Don't you know the way? He hasn't moved. So are you saying that your commitment is, if he looked right now, he would say, no, your commitment stinks. Now, some of you have never had it, right? You've always been living off in everybody else's, your husband, your wife, your parents' faith. It's time for that to change. Would you not agree? For some of you, it's, and maybe you're not there, but you're moving in this direction. Your love for him, you're very distracted right now. You're trying to serve him and another master at the same time. Some of you, basically, this is the bottom line of your serving. So somewhere along the line, when you started trying to serve two masters, you finally decided and chose the wrong master. Now, I can't convince you that you're serving Satan. You will tell me that you're still a good person and doing everything. You may even tell me, I pray. <laughs> you might even tell me, I go to church. Look, it's not about what I see. The whole m message, Jesus declares to those who were supposed to be his. And he says to them, I haven't found this among you. And because of that, he goes on and says, many of you are going to be surprised one day. Many of these will sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and with me. And many of you, you're going to have a terrible, terrible surprise. And I don't think a conversation with him about when you had a prayer and when you got wet and what you used to do is going to work at all. Because, you see, the only reason you and I would have that conversation because we think we're what? Worthy. And worthy. The problem is, So this morning, when he looks at you and me, what does he find? Is that what he you want him to find? What do you want him to find? There is something that you can't send someone to do. That you have to do on your own. For some of you, it may be a first time coming. For some of you, it may be, Lord, you're right. think you're pleased with what you see when you look at me. I know there was a day when I really believed you were, but today's not the day. And Lord, I come seeking you, like Isaiah said, because I believe you have gotten into my most uncomfortable zone of all. And I believe it's your voice and not Don Pearson's voice I hear right now. And I come saying to you, yeah, it's time for me to draw near. Party.
us there. Father, Lord, it won't last if it won't last if I if I make it so. No man can come to you unless you draw them. But we, I, are very much aware that when you draw, we can say no. And so, Father, I'm praying that you're drawing right now and there won't be any no's. There will be such clarity in each heart as to what it is you see but also what you're seeking. And I would pray, Father, that commitments, whether it be for salvation or for surrender, for submission, be made so that you find what you really seek in me and in us. Let it begin here today. First with me. Let my zeal be real, not faked or artificial. May my service to you be far more than what's done on this piece of property. May my heart yearn for you and not just talk about yearning for you. May my faith be not something that I just lead others to or talk about or teach. May my faith be pleasing to you. And Father, may the same kind of prayer be uttered with all the details that you are right now by your Holy Spirit seeking to hear and bring out of your people. Let this time be holy. You sanctify this altar. May it be holy as we seek you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.